Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Sabrina Devone, your moderator for today's presentation. I am a member of Flora's Office of Technology, which focuses on using science and innovative engineering technology to build a better world. Our engineers, designers, and experts, our people, are at the core of our success. Today's webinar is titled Successful Layer of Protection Analysis, or LOPA, Study and Follow-Up. Our subject matter experts today will highlight several aspects from risk assessment studies, particularly LOPA, sharing knowledge they've gained over the last 15 years. There are three key elements required to succeed in a LOPA study. Good preparation and alignment before the LOPA study, an experienced team who executes LOPA according to the plan, and finally, a proper follow-up. Our speakers will describe several case studies illustrating how the plant can achieve the required integrity with minimal costs and how the number of shutdowns can be reduced without sacrificing the integrity level. We have three speakers today. First, I'd like to introduce Andre Fijan. Andre Fijan is a floor fellow in process control and functional safety. Based in Floor's Amsterdam office, Andre has more than 30 years of experience, mainly in the petrochemical and gas industries. He's experienced in the definition and implementation of process control strategies and safety in instrumented functions during all phases of a project from conceptual engineering to commissioning. Andre holds a Master of Science degree in measurement and control from the University of Technology in Delft, the Netherlands and has been registered as a function, certified functional safety expert by TUV Sue Germany and Exeter Certification USA since 2006. Outside of work, Andre enjoys playing the piano, singing in a choir, as well as hiking, running, and cycling. Joining Andre is Florin Omoda. Florin is also a floor fellow in process control and functional safety who's also in our Amsterdam office. He has 36 years of overall experience in research activities and the design of gas and petrochemical facilities. He joined FLOOR 17 years ago and specialized in, in the design of complex process control, automation, optimization, and safety systems. Florin holds a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Amsterdam and is also a certified functional safety expert by Exeter. On a personal note, Flora enjoys playing tennis, table tennis, chess, and bridge. Flora has a very strong safety-driven culture, and as such, it is customary for us to start our meetings with a brief safety topic. So our third speaker is Larissa Sandu. She will set the stage for today's webinar by delivering the safety topic. Larissa holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Petroleum and Gas Engineering in Romania. Based in the Amsterdam office for the last five years, she has performed different roles as part of the process engineering group, as well as in the marketing and sales departments. Her project experience includes working on various chemical and polymer projects, such as developing deliverables for process design packages. Outside of work, Larissa enjoys painting, playing tennis, and volunteering at her local bird sanctuary. Larissa, Please unmute your line to share the safety topic with us. Thank you for the introduction, Sabrina. My safety topic focuses on process safety incidents and way of preventing them. As we can see from this graph, high profile incidents with a major impact on public opinion and or legislation have happened in the past and unfortunately continue to take place. These process safety incidents can be catastrophic, causing fatalities, damaging the environment, destroying company assets and reputations, but also affect the society that is dependent on them to produce a value-added product. So what can we do to try to prevent these major incidents? Well, uh, we can learn from the past events so we're aware of what led to those accidents and try to prevent them in the future. So the incident investigation analysis should include the following direct causes, which is what prompted the incident, indirect causes, what events contributed to the direct cause of the incident, and root causes, what practice or knowledge would have prevented the incident from occurring. 
on the prevention side of the story, we have the risk analysis, which should include a safe design early in the, in, in the engineering phase, but also safety analysis studies, such as hazard and operability study, abbreviated HAZOP, which is a useful tool in identifying potential hazard scenarios, so only for qualitative indication to see if safeguards exist to mitigate the hazard. A layer of protection analysis, abbreviated LOPA, which is a more detailed analysis, which allows the safety review team to discover weaknesses in the safeguards identified in the HAZOP study. So LOPA might prevent uh, hazardous scenarios or mitigate the severity of the consequences. So this brings me to the end of my short safety topic, and I would like to conclude that despite the incident investigation, together with the risk analysis being taken into consideration, the latest engineering standards being applied and implemented by all industries, these incidents continue to occur. But more about how useful and the value that the LOPA study brings to design will be explained by my colleagues Andre and Florin in this presentation. I will now turn the floor over to Andre for the main presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Larissa, for presenting the process safety topic. My name is Andre Vitian, and I will present the first part of the LOPA webinar. Let us start with the definition of what LOPA basically is. It stands for Layer of Protection Analysis. A protection layer is an independent safety function which can intervene in the process in case a potential hazard is starting to occur. It has process measurements, a logic function, and actuators like block files within the process or relays to stop rotating equipment. LOPA is a simplified form of a semi-quantitative risk assessment to comply with industry standards and regulatory expectations on functional safety like this documented in the IC 615.08 or 615.11. Why should we apply this? Why should any industrial facility tolerate a risk factor higher than associated with driving a car? What is tolerable and what is acceptable? Acceptable might be the risk when driving a car, which is 0.015% per year for fatality in the United States. Tolerable might be a higher risk. So the number for loss of life for workers might be between 0.15% and 1.5% per year. The lower, the better, of course. There is no life without risk, but you must investigate and document the risks to know and to decide if they are acceptable or at least tolerable. And that is why LOPA can help you to document this in a clear way and show if further protection is required or not. How do we do LOPA? There are different ways to do LOPA and each type of industry may have its own way of doing this. Because there were so many different implementations of LOPA, the CCPS defined a kind of standard guideline in their books since 2001. The CCPS stands for Center for Chemical Process Safety within the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. They basically tried to harmonize the different developments of LOPA within industry. They show the differences and they guide you to select what they think the most appropriate default values should be. In practice, LOPA can be applied with two approaches. The first approach is the original qualitative LOPA, which is conservative, but simple. I will give you a brief introduction of this approach and we'll be talking about how it's implemented in practice. The second approach is the quantitative LOPA, which is more precise, but also more time consuming. This will be presented later by my colleague Florin, along with LOPA recommendations and his experience in reducing the SIF demand rate. At FLOOR, we always make a so-called terms of reference document for the LOPA study, because all the applicable rules and choices must be documented in advance and to be agreed upon with our clients. The same is applicable for the target parameters 
and the default frequencies of the different events, the failure rates of the various safeguards, and the assumptions that will be used to calculate the SIL assessment. As mentioned before, the CCPS guidelines help you to select the most appropriate default values and assumptions. Once this is documented and agreed, we can do a LOPA study in a consistent and traceable way. So let us start with the qualitative LOPA approach, also called order of magnitude approach or semi-quantitative LOPA. The hazard scenarios and the safeguards are evaluated during the HESOP study. And certain scenarios can be selected for further evaluation during the LOPA study. Those may be, for example, the high risk scenarios and the more complex scenarios, including multiple or conditional initiating events. Also scenarios where there is doubt if the present safeguards are sufficient or not. Then the LOPA study will be executed for each selected scenario. Associated hazard is defined with the severity ranking and the target event frequency. The dominant initiating event is selected with its likelihood. Further, all the applicable independent protection layers, the IPLs, with their risk reduction factor must be documented. And also the enabling events and the conditional modifiers, if applicable, must be documented. Then it's time to check if there is a gap between the target and the mitigated event frequency. If there is a gap, an additional independent protection layer will be required with usually a risk reduction factor of 10, 100, or 1000. This is basically the standard qualitative LOPA approach. There are some interesting implementation topics to be discussed. First, do we use the dominating initiating event or multiple initiating events? The CCPS in 2001 states, select the most frequent one. However, the IAC 61511 in 2016 says that all events need to be listed. What to do? In a certain way, you can cluster similar events. For example, the control loop failure, because that might be a combination of either a failure of the control measurement or the control valve or an operator failure with the controller. It might also include the failure of manual block files around the control set. Basically, all these events can be combined because they lead to a similar process situation, the failure of the control loop. And you can allocate just one common failure rate number, usually one in 10 years. However, not all events are similar and do not share the same IPLs. This means that if you want to totalize them, you must totalize all the mitigated frequencies instead of totalizing the frequency of the initiating events, which is more complicated. Well, what can we do? The practical solution is clustering similar events and then list all the initiating events, totalize them and round them up. Further, you can only use the common IPLs, which of course is a shortcut, but likely conservative. The alternative solution is to use the quantitative LOPA for these scenarios. The next topic, topic to be discussed is checking for completeness of the selected HESOP scenarios. Are there scenarios which are not selected and still need evaluation? For example, the scenarios which have too less safeguards or have safeguards which have too low reliability or scenarios which have safeguards which are not really IPLs. Because an IPL means that the safeguard must be specific for the scenario it must be independent from the initiating event and from the other IPLs. It must also have a minimum reliability, usually at least a risk reduction factor of 10, and the reliability should be auditable. Not all safeguards have these requirements. 
So in that case, the safeguard is not an IPL and no credit can be taken for that. How to handle this situation? A practical solution is to select the scenarios from HESOP based on the raw risk category, which means the unmitigated consequence severity. Because then at least all scenarios, which for example may result in a potential loss of life, are covered by the LOPA study. Next topic is how to correctly use the BPCS, the Basic Process Control System, within LOPA. The BPCS has the possibility to have different protection layers, a control function, a switch function, an interlock function, and an alarm function. How many protection layers are allowed in the BPCS? It was always a discussion item until the IC 61511 defined that up to two independent BPCS protection layers are allowed when the initiating event is not related to a BPCS failure. If it's re related to a BPCS failure, like for example the control loop failure, then only one protection function is allowed. Having the possibility to include four different protection functions in the BPCS, but in practice not taking credit for them in the LOPA because of the IC regulation, it may still create discussion during LOPA. The solution is then that it must be ad addressed and agreed in advance in the terms of reference what will be applied. Because that is a topic that is not, should not be part of the LOPA study itself. The next topic is how to implement different risk reduction factors. The LOPA will usually result in a SIL assessment for the IPL with different risk reduction factors, but always being an order of magnitude. For example, it could be a risk reduction factor of 10. This can be implemented either as a SIL1 function in the safety instrumented system, the SIS, or it can be implemented in the basic process control system, the BPCS. According to IC 615.11, it is allowed to take credit for a risk reduction factor of 10 maximum for a BPCS function. If the SIL assessment results in an IPL with an RF of 100, that normally means a SIL 2 function in the SIS. The question then is, can we split the SIL 2 in two SIL 1 functions. If you implement them in the safety instrumented system, then the SIS must be at least SIL 2. And the functions must be independent from each other, which means that the process measurements and the actuators must be independent. Otherwise, it is not allowed to split the SIL 2 function in two SIL 1 functions. You might also think that in this case, you could put one function in the BPCS and one function in the SIS. However, only a limited, limited number of IPL functions are allowed within the BPCS, according IEC 615.11, which means that this is usually not a viable option. Or the SIL assessment can result in an IPL with a risk reduction factor of 1000 which is normally a SIL-3 function in this SIS. Then there's also the discussion if we can split the SIL-3 function in SIL-1 functions or a combination of a SIL-1 and a SIL-2 function. Well, first of all, the SIS must be then at least a SIL-3 system. And if you split the functions, they all have to be independent from each other. Sometimes, there is a discussion about the HIPS, the High Integrity Pressure Protection System, which is a system that is usually applied when no credit can be taken for relief valves, or relief valves are not applied because of the practical situation in the plant, a flare limitation. In those cases, the HIPS system must always be completely independent from the SIS, which usually already contains a high pressure protection function. The last topic to discuss is sharing hardware between BPCS and the SIS. Sharing hardware means there is a common mode failure, and then independent IPLs become partly dependent. 
An example are three level measurements, which are connected to both the SIS and the BPCS. The SIS uses them for the two out of three voting, and the BPCS uses the middle out of three as a signal for the control loop, which has the advantage that the control loop becomes more reliable and has a lower demand on the safety function than in case one control measurement is being used. According to IC 615.11, it is allowed, but you must calculate that the part of the common mode failure is relatively small as compared to the overall coverage of the safety function. Same is applicable for block files, which can have solenoids from both BPCS and SIS. This has the advantage that the block valve is used for switching by the BPCS, so it is regularly moving, and when necessary, the SIS can force the block valve to be closed by an independent solenoid. However, if there is a block valve failure, then the SIS cannot intervene, and therefore it is not allowed in that case. So you must look at the applicable scenario, which is leading to the hazard. Same is applicable for the control valves, which can have an additional solenoid from the SIS, as shown in the sketch. Here we see a vessel with two control loops, a level control loop to maintain the level in the vessel, and a control loop to adjust the flow entering the vessel. In addition, there is a level protection, which has a separate measurement in this case. The level protection function in the SIS can act on both control loops, and it can act in two ways. What is allowed and what is not allowed? Of course, it will depend on the scenario, but the most likely scenario for a problem with the level is the, in the vessel is the level control loop failure in the BPCS. So the downstream control loop is likely the initiating event of the scenario, in which case the safety function in the SIS cannot rely on the downstream control valve if it will be still able to function. Therefore, it should use the upstream control valve, which is not related to level. It can use the solenoid on the control valve or the software link to the BPCS and switch the controller in manual mode with zero output. The hardware solution with the solenoid is considered more reliable, but you can always do both. This is the advantage that the controller windup is prevented as well. So sharing hardware between BPCS and SAS is something to consider. But always be careful when to apply it and how to apply it. So far, my part of the presentation, I will now give the word to my colleague Florin to continue with the quantitative LOPA. Thank you, Andre. My name is Florino Mota and I will continue with more detailed quantitative LOPA. Qualitative LOPA is simple using integer numbers which represents order of magnitude. Quantitative LOPA is using positive rational numbers. The risk reduction factors from quantitative LOPA are not power of 10. Therefore, the seal is calculated and reported together with the risk reduction factor. There are even more precise methods like bowtie analysis or QRA. Bowtie analysis is used for scenarios with multiple causes and multiple consequences. QRA stands for quantitative risk analysis in, contrast, in contrast to initial semi-quantitative LOPA based on a single initiating event and a single consequence. The methodology used in quantitative LOPA and qualitative LOPA remains more or less the same. They are using a tolerable likelihood and typically they are based on the risk matrix. One issue with the client risk matrix, which has discrete representation, is that loss of, for example, $2 million or $9 million may have the same range of severity. That means in a qualitative LOPA is the same, while quantitative LOPA uses the exact numbers. Quantitative LOPA can deal with complex scenarios having multiple initiating events, as mentioned by Andre. We don't only list them, but we accumulate the risk from all initiating events. For executing LOPA, there are available software programs like PAJ Wars or Excellencia. 
However, these calculations are relatively simple and they can be easily implemented even in Excel. For a qualitative LOPA, we can use the risk matrix. The range of initiating event likelihood is shown on columns and the severity of the consequences are shown on rows. Risk matrix is showing how much risk we have in each cell. In the top right area, which is green, the risk is negligible. In the yellow area, the risk is higher, but it's still tolerable. That's why we have a factor of one. Red area means higher risk, which is unacceptable. In this area, we need to apply a risk reduction factor of 10, 100, 1000 or higher that can be associated with SIL1, SIL2 or SIL3. In the blue area, the risk is so high that it cannot be reduced by a single safety instrumented function. The risk matrix may have a problem. What is the risk reduction factor at the border when the risk is changing with an order of magnitude? If you take a point in quantitative LOPA, we will need to define a smooth transition between these uh, levels. So to correlate the likelihood and severity with a smooth transition. What is the solution? A diagonal line in the matrix has an invariant or constant risk. We define a line at the border between the yellow and red areas as the target tolerable risk. Then we have a diagonal uh, interval in the red area. First, the interval offers a risk reduction of 10, but is continuously increasing. Then we have another uh, range when the risk reduction is between 10 and 100 and so on. In order to calibrate the matrix for a target tolerable risk, we need a single point in, on the diagonal line, which is the target tolerable risk. For example, loss of a life event. This event is, uh, has a severity between uh, row 4 and row 5, because typically we assign severity 4 for maximum loss of a life and uh, catastrophal severity level 5 for one or more fatalities. Then we can have uh, another situation with a loss of uh, 1 million euro. We can use also that point for calibration. If you look in the matrix, loss of 10 million uh, dollars is exactly in the same point corresponding to one event in 10,000 years. It's exactly the same as loss of life. From HAZOP, we have scenarios with multiple initiating events. We take credit for all causes and we can make a summation of all initiating frequencies. Then we can apply the risk reduction factors for barriers, enabling conditions, conditional modifiers and safeguards. Sometimes the initiating events do not have the same barriers. In this case, we can use only initiating event and only barriers which are applicable for each initiating event. Mitigated event likelihood indicates if you have a gap in risk matrix when the mitigated event likelihood is higher than the target event likelihood. If we exclude the independent protection layer, that's the SIF, safety instrumented function, then the resulted product is intermediate event likelihood. This is the basis for determining the risk reduction factor for SIF. Uh, the final risk reduction factor required for SIF can then be converted to SIL with a required risk reduction factor. In qualitative LOPA, the risk reduction factor is rounded off to the next power of 10. If the reduction factor requires, required is 10, uh, 50, then we assume a risk reduction of 100 and we assign a SIL2. In quantitative LOPA, in contrast with qualitative LOPA, we report SIL1 with a risk reduction factor of 50, without any rounding off. 
Implementation of a SIL1 function will cost less than a SIL2 function because SIL number is lower. However, as inconvenience, the risk is higher because of less protection. The risk reduction factor remains 50. This is like standing on a cliff exposed to the maximum risk. Is it worth to spend more time for quantitative LEOPA? From a cost perspective, yes. Some companies may apply an additional factor to reduce the risk, like taking one step back. LOPA provides a risk reduction factor that is used for implementation of safety functions which have a SIL1, SIL2, or SIL3. While in qualitative LOPA, SIL1 plus SIL1 equals SIL2, this is not valid in qualitative LOPA. For example, two SIL1 functions with a risk reduction factor of 40 and 50 means a total risk reduction factor of 2000, corresponding to a SIL3. Usually for SIL1, a single instrument is sufficient, while for higher SIL, we use redundant instruments. Diversity of instruments can also offer a higher level of integrity. Or even better, we can consider an alternative protection not in the safety system, and then we can reduce the SIL. When implementing safety functions, we look at both reliability and availability. Reliability is a safety requirement. We ensure that trip actions are performed when we need them. The availability of a unit or a plant is not a safety requirement, but still depends on the failure rates of the safety functions. In case of a one out of two voting system, the system is very reliable. In case of a two out of two voting, we can increase the availability. Two out of three voting requires three instruments, but it combines the higher availability and high reliability, therefore being the preferred option. LOPA recommendations are essential for designing of a safety system. It's very common that recommending alerts in RESO has at no cost, but when you have a LOPA study, we require to validate every alarm as IPL to be specific, independent, dependable, and auditable. The operator needs time to respond to an alarm. He needs need to know exactly what to do and how to perform correctly all the required actions. Process safety time is the parameter used to validate alarms. Therefore, it's a good practice to have it calculated before LOPA. More alarm, alarms doesn't mean more protection, especially if the cause is the same and we have multiple alarms, it can be even annoying. In this case, LOPA will only consider a single IPL in BPCS. The alarm system should have increased priority of safety alarms from LOPA. The operator training and display messages in BPCS will also increase the effectiveness of these alarms. But what to do if an alarm is not an IPL? LOPA recommendations can be implementation of another alarm, especially when we have them from HAZOP. Otherwise, we have to identify one. Sometimes, if the reason is time, then the alarm set point can be changed, so the operator will get more time to do the actions. If the time to respond to an alarm is by far too short for the operator, then we can implement an automatic action in BPCS, unless exceeding the maximum of two IPLs. If the LOPA requires a risk, risk reduction factor of one or less, it means the scenario is already safe and we don't need additional protection. If a SIF has a re reduction factor determined after LOPA, which is one or less, then it can be removed because we don't need this SIF. We can also relocate the safety instrumented function from the safety system to BPCS because it will be less expensive. But we can also have additional protection if you keep it in the safety system. In this case, we don't need to assign a specific SEAL because the risk reduction required is very low, so SEAL verification is not needed. For a risk reduction factor up to 10, we may consider taking procedural measures or implement safety functions in BPCS or safety system. 
If it is an existing function in the safety system, then we need to upgrade the safety instrumented function to a higher seal with a higher risk reduction factor. Up to a risk reduction factor of 10,000, we can apply a seal 1 or seal 2 or seal 3. But what to do if you have higher risk with a risk reduction factor above 10,000? In principle, it is possible to implement a SEAL-4, but this is not common practice for the process industry, and it's also not recommended. We can consider additional independent protector layers, like mechanical devices or BPCS function, and then to reduce the SEAL. We can also use an independent safety system, like mentioned before, an HIPS, HIPS standing for High Integrity Pressure Protection System. Or we can redesign the process and completely remove the scenario. Let's analyze now two complex safety functions. For example, let's consider a safety function which is activated by low gas flow. We may need pressure, temperature, molecular weight compensation for flow uh, gas, which is measured but might vary. And the trip, it might be two out of three. Voting. One option is to implement three calculations block, each calculation based on four instruments, flow, pressure, temperature, molecular weight. So firstly, we calculate three compensated flows, then we apply two out of three voting. We need in this case 12 instruments. We can also apply a middle out of three for each process variable. A middle value is the most reliable measurement. So using the most reliable measurements, we can do a single compensation for the gas flow, which is calculated once, and the voting will be one out of one. When possible, we can also estimate the flow, which is compensated with the most conservative pressure, temperature, and molecular weight. Thus, we can avoid the calculation in the safety system, and we can trip only on two out of three flow measurements. Another example, uh, let's suppose that we have a reactor with two reactants A and B. We have two safety functions. One trip is on high half flow of component A and another trip is on low low flow of component B. The problem is that changing the reactor throughput may cause a trip on low low flow from B component. What is the solution? The solution is to consider a single trip on flow ratio. Uh, the trip will be on high high if you define the ratio between A divided by B. In this case, any change of the reactor throughput is acceptable unless the ratio between the two reactants exceeds the safety limit. Based on LOPA recommendations, we implement SEAL, meaning further design or redesign of the safety system. Standard design of safety functions is very well known and documented in the international uh, standards, IEC 6215.11, 6215.08, and consists of redundant instrumentation, regular testing, maintenance, operators should be trained for upsets and process shutdown, and so on. The availability of a plant can be increased by preventing spurious or real shutdowns. We can improve the design by having a reduced demand of the safety functions, eventually using only existing instrumentation without to have them as independent protection layers. We can have, for example, dynamic simulation studies to identify the process response time for upset scenarios. We can have protective control in BPCS or BPCS interlocks, which can prevent a shutdown without being independent protection layers in LOPA. We can have also a progressive shutdown of a plant instead of a single general shutdown, which can lead to delays in production and it's economically not desired. We can also trip uh, with a delay and let the operator responding and preventing a shutdown. A cutback system can perform an automatic set of actions in BPCS, typically acting on multiple controllers. In case of an upset or partial loss of control, the operator operating parameters are changed slowly to less profitable region, but still safe, preventing in this way a shutdown. 
Remember there are three key elements required to succeed in a LOPA study. A good preparation and alignment before the LOPA study. An experienced team who executes LOPA according to the plan. And proper follow-up to ensure reliability and safety of system, safety system and availability of the plant. I would like to thank you for attending this webinar. We are looking forward to receiving your questions. Thank you, Florin, Andre, and Larissa. So let's take a moment to address questions we've received from the audience. Again, if you would like to submit your question, please type it into the Q&A tab and send it to all panelists. So our first question is, what is FLOR's standard LOPA procedure? Is it qualitative or quantitative? If I may answer that question, uh, we are uh, an engineering company and we are working for our clients. So basically our clients have already made the choice if they want to do it qualitative or quantitative. So we can do both and the client uh, decides. Thank you. So previously you mentioned that the latest edition of the CCPS is in 2001. Can you recommend the, the any latest literature? Yes, uh, well, there are two things. Uh, the book layer of protection analysis is from 2001. However, the guidelines for initiating events are uh, first published in 2007 and updated in uh, 2015. And the third book is uh, published in 2014. However, there is more literature available. And if I can recommend, then it is the website of exida.com where you can find an, quite a large number of white papers on this subject and also books which are available. Thank you. So next on slide 27, the risk reduction factor is less than one. So why do you recommend having a sill function? Wouldn't it increase the maintenance costs? Yes, it will, but uh, you always can have more protection than is needed, especially for uh, quantitative LOPA. We are at the border. If you are going to tolerable risk, maximum tolerable risk. So if the client prefer to have more protection, it's always acceptable. So never contested. And uh, it's only a matter of money. It can be less expensive than it, if it's implemented in BPCS but not necessarily should be removed, it's an option. Thank you. So another question, is it allowed to have alarms with a higher risk reduction factor than 10 when implemented in SIS with independent enunciation? If I may respond to that question, uh... Of course, that is uh, allowed. Uh, they are called so called safety alarms. Uh, however, since the operator is also part uh, of this loop, um, it is very difficult to yeah to confirm to 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 motiv to, uh, to motivate that this uh, risk reduction factor is higher than ten. Not because of the hardware, because it's independent hardware but because of the operator uh, response involved. Uh, within CCPS, uh, they have uh, so-called drilled operators, which they give a value of SIL2. So uh, when it's a clear procedure for the operator what to do, then it might be increased up to SIL2. However, this is not very common uh, applied within our projects. I would like to add that typically this should be documented. So if there is a need for a such function and is not already in the terms of reference before LOPA, during the LOPA it can be a recommendation and the client should decide if this is acceptable or not or what is the level of reliability of an operator with specific procedures. Because, for example, an operator with a checklist is more reliable than an operator which doesn't have a checklist or is doing uh, non-routine operations. Thank you. All right. I have another question. So on slide 10, I believe that we, there was an image 
showing the question is are there regulations for acceptable or tolerable risk and if not what can be used as a standard reference for acceptable risk maybe i can start <laughs> yes go uh, yes so uh, that's a point with uh, the risk matrix the risk matrix is not showing or it's showing what is tolerable and what is acceptable however that definition doesn't make too much sense uh, can you go to previous slide, please, 21? So in the risk matrix, you can see that you have very clearly defined what is acceptable or tolerable risk. However, that's not really important because now if you go to the next slide, whatever it matters for LOPA is that line which is on the diagonal represented as target tolerable risk. This will provide for any severity an acceptable likelihood. All right. Thank you. So another question. Um, in which industry is SIL 4 acceptable? And how can we ach achieve this as far as are there SIL 4 instrument rated instruments, at least in the oil and gas industry? Oh, uh, I'm currently working on a, a project where we have a SIL 4 uh, application. But that is not the petrochemical industry, it's uh, the nuclear industry. So indeed, SIL-4 is uh, possible. It's also more or less common within the nuclear industry. Um, of course, we need to have special hardware for that, uh, special uh, configurations in the voting mechanisms. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to... Yeah, as I mentioned uh, a brand, but okay, there are several uh, brands in the in the Lossic solvers available for SIL four applications. Okay. And a, a follow up, I'm not certain. And is it a nested two out of three? Uh, well, that, that that is that is a possibility uh, for uh, the, the say the, the the measurements and the final elements. For the logic solvers, uh, they have uh, yeah, dedicated uh, hardware, which is completely uh, hard-coded and not software-related. And that is how they, and, and by minimizing uh, the components and uh, maximizing the redundancy, they uh, yeah, have the fixtures available that uh, allows for the SIL4 uh, application. Well, it looks like that's all the time that we have. Actually, sorry, there's one more question that just arrived. And the question is, when the BPCS and SIS share components, can you advise what method you would use to analyze the system to confirm that the design meets the, necessi the necessary risk reduction factor requirements while meeting independence? Uh, well, in the IC standards, there are some rules uh, already uh, given. Uh, basically, uh, the components uh, should be wired to the SIS system. And when they are wired through to the BPCS, then no failure in the BPCS may cause a failure in the SIS. The component itself, if that is the, the uh, cause of the failure, then the common mode part has to be calculated, which is also mentioned in the IC 61511. And that has to be proportional. Uh, and there are no uh, hard uh, numbers given. It should be reasonable that they say, okay, if the common mode failure is 1% and we're talking about a uh, function that provides, say, uh, a SIL2 application, then this. Uh, 1% is acceptable. But again, it's, 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 it's uh, yeah, a rather new uh, element within the IC because it's, well, it was driven from the market because people want uh, to find uh, yeah, a rational way to use common hardware because it would reduce cost. And like I mentioned in the example, uh, the combination of a two out of three together with a middle out of three provides uh, increased reliability which uh, in the control system 
which means uh, lower demand on the SIS system. So that is an advantage, but if it takes a demand on the SIS system, how does it then uh, function still? So it's a complicated uh, thing. And uh, basically uh, the engineering or the, the client has to make those calculations and uh, show them to the authorities for approval. Maybe I can indicate also a shortcut because the additional protection from a BPCS, which is function, which is not completely independent, will bring a, a reduction factor of less than 10. Maybe it's better even not to consider and just to assume that the safety function remains in CIS and not to take any credit for BPCS. So if you have a still to function in safety system plus BPCS, which can be considered independent, that better to consider only a safety function with a seal tree and that avoid complex calculation. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, so with that, it looks like uh, that's the all the time that we have for questions. So thank you again, Andre and Florin for this informative webinar and thank you for the time that you've spent in preparation. So thank you to our audience for attending and it's been a pleasure being your moderator. So we will next host our next webinar on July 14th, where floor subject matter experts Nancy Kralik and Lucy Brady will discuss floor's net zero journey. So please continue to stay informed of these events by visiting our innovation builders page on floor.com or following our social media channels using hashtag innovation builders. If you'd like to receive email notifications of future webinars, please email us at innovation.builders at floor.com with opt-in in the subject line. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for joining us. We'll send out a compiled list of the Q and A's within a few days, along with notification that the webinar recording is available for replay on floor.com. So if you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back to you. From all of us on the Innovation Builders team, have a very safe day.